Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Katie Stover, the Director of Reader Services for the Kansas City Public Library, and I am thrilled and a little saddened to welcome you here tonight to our last Big Read signature event for An American Sunrise by Joy Harjo. This has been the library's seventh Big Read, and we started in 2007. But this is the first time we've done a work of poetry, and this is the first time we've done an author of color. And I can tell you that of all the times we've given away copies of our Big Read books, because we've always done that, this is the first time we have given away almost 700 copies of this book. I say almost 700 because there's five left on the back counter back there. <laughs> if you did not get a copy of An American Sunrise, now's your chance. Um, funding for this big read comes from the NEA and Arts Midwest, who manages the big read. And it also comes locally from Travoy, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, and the David Oliver through the Francis Family Foundation, and the Maria Rosa Menical Lecture Series. I point them out because without their generous support, we would not have been able to bring in the poet Joy Harjo earlier in April for National Poetry Month. And if you have not seen that, if you didn't get to attend on her, on the day she was with us, here with us, with us, here with us at the library, then you have until May 31st to see the recording of the live stream. After that, it will not be available. There are so many people to thank when the library does a big read. And I wanna first point out our planning committee, which consisted of Cindy Hull, Carrie Cornelius from Haskell Indian Nations University, and Gaylene Krauser, the executive director of the Kansas City Indian Center. Without their help, this big read would not have been possible. They shepherded us all through this process of making sure this was an event that wasn't just about reading a book, but bringing the Kansas City community together and raising awareness culturally. Um, I have lots and lots of others to thank. So, you know who kept it going, this big read? Jennifer Tufts. So whenever I thought I was gonna lose my mind, Jennifer Tufts was able to break it down into manageable bite-sized quantities. And other members of the planning committee that made it easy for me, such as Margaret Perkins McGinnis and Lauren Park and Rebecca Blacksom, who I really can't thank enough because she wrote the grant and that would have really sent me round the bend. Um, if you enjoyed any of our Big Read signature events, then you really have Leslie Case to thank for that. She's sitting in the back. She's handled all of our AV. If you saw us on social media anywhere, then that's because of the hard work that Lindsay Fote put into our Big Read. And if you were impressed by the art, which was a departure for us when it comes to Big Read, then we have Andy Dandino to thank for that. He was inspired by one of Joy Harjo's poems in um, honor of her artist friend, T.C. Cannon. So tonight, however, the biggest thanks for tonight goes to Craig Augie, because he joined KCPL in the midst of this Big Read, and we all turned to him and said, have an exhibit, <laughs> and he did. You saw the wonderful work that he put together downstairs in our Goldner Gallery. So I am very thrilled and pleased to bring Craig Augie to the podium to talk to us about the art and these marvelous artists that you're gonna hear from in just a moment. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Katie. Yeah, as, as Katie mentioned, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm relatively new to the library staff here as exhibit specialist, and uh, The Heart is a Fist was the uh, first exhibit that I worked on, and I just wanna say I'm so grateful um, to have been able to work on that first. It's just been a real, a real pleasure for me. Uh, the Heart is a Fist is truly a centerpiece to this year's Big Read, tying together so many important themes uh, that are important to indigenous Americans woven through an American sunrise. 
I have been personally inspired, enlightened, and energized by the artwork and the concepts and stories behind the work. I truly believe the voices of indigenous artists, poets, musicians, and other luminaries are crucial to how we navigate our collective present and build a more just and compassionate future. I want to take a moment to recognize all of the amazing artists in the exhibit. Um, if, if you happen to be here in the audience tonight, I don't know if there's other artists from the exhibit here tonight. Um, if you are, if you, if you could stand to be recognized. Um, but I just want to give all of the artists in the fabulous exhibit a wonderful round of applause. <clears throat> I'd like to now introduce our three exhibiting panelists. First, we are joined by Mia Chamberlain, who is originally from Riverside, California. She is currently a junior at Haskell and is majoring in business with a minor in pre-med. We also have Yvonne C. Trujillo, who is a sophomore at Haskell and a part-time transfer student living in Taos, New Mexico. She works full-time as the Taos Pueblo Gaming Commission Executive Director. She is married with four children, three college-educated adults and one 11-year-old, and is a grandmother of two. Molly Adams recently graduated magna cum laude from Haskell in spring 2022 with a BA in Indigenous and American Indian Studies. She works as a freelance news photographer while also a mom of three. She co-founded the nonprofit Save Our Schools 497, wearing numerous hats within that organization. We are moderated this evening by Krishan McKenney, who is Director of Learning and Engagement at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. We were also originally to be joined by David Titterington, instructor in the College of Arts and Humanities at Haskell Indian Nations University, who helped foster the students' works and organized the Heart as a Fist exhibit. He is unable to join us tonight, but has prepared a short video, which we will share now. And from there, I will give it over to Krishan. Um, I want you to please stick around for the Q&A after the discussion. And I just want to thank you all again so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Greetings, my beautiful friends and fellow students of art. Thank you all so much for coming out and supporting Haskell Indian Nations University students. Um, something just really quick about Haskell. It is truly an international university with representatives from over 150 different tribal nations all gathered together in a fairly small university in Lawrence, Kansas, which makes it one of the most diverse places on the planet. And so you can imagine how great it is to work there. And you can also probably imagine how much great artwork is produced there. And there is a lot. A lot of art and creativity comes out of Haskell. And let's be honest, most art in general is more or less forgettable. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just so much. But then there are the works that you remember, that stick with you, that continually teach you more about yourself and about the world. And these are the kinds of works that we selected for this exhibition. And so uh, just a little bit about how the whole thing came about. It was back in January of last year that the library contacted me and asked if there was any student work, recent student work, that reflected on some of the themes in Joy Harjo's new book. And so I read the book and said, yes, absolutely. And so then we combed through about a hundred student projects, all of which you can actually view yourself online through our digital art catalog, Visual Nation. And we selected the works that we felt were the highest quality, but also works that we felt were totally new, or um, these were things that we had never seen before, truly novel visual experiences. And then we also wanted to um, uh, select a diverse bouquet of voices and moods, which is just like in the book, 
And so we chose works that you know made us happy, made us laugh, made us cry, uh, and of course works that made us think about the world in a new way. Anyway, uh, y'all are so lucky. I wish I could be there with you. Um, I'm going to be watching the live stream and also participating in the chat so I won't be too far away. Okay, um, that's it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, David. Uh, wherever you are in the virtual world right now, I know you're, you're joining us. Uh, online and uh, very much appreciate that David is still here participating and uh, once again welcome uh, and good evening to all of you it's an honor for me to be here and certainly participating in this event and uh, welcoming these incredible women that I have here before us that are joining us this evening so hello to Molly and Yvonne and Mia so glad to have you all here with us and uh, we're going to begin this evening with the power of their words. You're going to hear from these incredible artists their statements that you may have read uh, when you're viewing the incredible exhibition downstairs. So I'm going to begin with Mia. If you would please share your artistry and statement with us. Yes, of course. So my artist statement is, I took to the urban streets of California and clothed myself in symbolic materials. The red line mapped across my body represents the Red River of the North where, my, where many bodies of missing sisters have been found. The white paint and blue clothes also have significance as does the cracks and unevenness in the background. They suggest violence, transformation, and a state of being in the in-between. As I lay on the streets of Westwood, California, which was once Tongva land, I felt the presence of being foreign to the locals. Native American issues need to be broadcasted to the world and not hidden. We need more people to help fight with us and understand the struggles we go through. Commonly, people around the world think of Native Americans as mythical creatures or that all the real Indians are gone. Due to the ignorance, people do not know the challenges we have faced and continue to face today. Thank you so much, Mia. All right, Yvonne, please share your artistry with us. Sure. So my piece was called The Quiet. Um, before I read my piece, um, just want you to think of the adjective. And it's, you know, having to do with being discreet, done discreetly. Um, the noun is also a silence and a calm. So think of that as I read this. This is a memorial dedicated to all the Native children who never returned home from the boarding schools. It is also meant for the missing Indigenous women and girls everywhere who are yet to be found. There are 966 hands around the vessel representing the 215 children recovered from the Cam Kamluth and the 751 children recovered from Maribal. More have since been found. The paint was originally orange, the popular color that was used to honor the missing children. But to my surprise, after cooking the pot, all of the hands turned white. Already some responses. Thank you so much, <laughs> Yvonne. And then Molly, please share with us. OK. My piece is called The Very Accurate Norsemen. This series is inspired by Edward Curtis's work documenting the vanishing Indian. Curtis was known to stage and edit his photos to promote his own version of Native Americans. And those images still influence us today. In this series, I, a Cherokee woman, entered an alternate timeline to document the vanishing Norsemen. <laughs> These photos are of counterfeit Norsemen doing whatever I think a Norseman should do to appear as Norse as possible while representing all Norse people and Norse history. When you think of a Norseman, I hope you'll be able to only think of the images I've created. They're as accurate as they need to be, regardless of the kangaroo skins the subjects are prominently displaying upon their chests. <laughs> oh, somebody said, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. So I wanted us to start off with having our panelists share their words because, again, it is about the power that those words hold. 
And so now I'm going to have our conversation here. I know we're separated a little bit, but just <laughs> think of us just hanging out. <laughs> and I'm going to start with you, uh, Mia. If you can talk more about your experience of creating your particular artwork. You know, you were doing this in a public setting. Uh, First of all, have you done any type of work like that before? But then also, what was your experience like creating that work? Why did you choose to respond in that way? Yes, yeah, so I have not done anything uh, like that before, especially in public. Mm -hmm. It was a really interesting uh, experience, uh, as you can tell in the guy in the photo, how he's just walking past. That is actually some random uh, student that attends uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. And he was just walking back to his apartment from his morning coffee. And it was really it, cool and crazy to go through this experience because when he was walking, we asked him, do you mind being in this photo to get his permission? And we just instructed him, please do not look at me. And it was hard for him. We talked to him afterwards, after we took the photo, and he just was like, wow, how, how do you not look at that in the middle of the street? And I've had people come up out of their apartments asking me if I was dead, and people driving past to come see, and people were asking, can I be, in, can I be involved? And unfortunately, I'd already gotten this piece, but it was, it was really ex cool. And, it was educational to those around me, um, especially other fellow college students, and it just opened the eyes. Uh, but for me, I think it was important for me to respond in this way because from being from Southern California, I am surrounded by major tribes, and unfortunately, there is no talk or discussion about the missing and murdered indigenous women. So. I thought, what better way to show the public out there, who, which is once native land. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And when you were filming or photographing, you know, how long was that process? This specific photo probably took about two minutes. Oh, to that do. was it. <laughs> <laughs> but in, and, there, in and out. There was a quite a. There's a whole collection that we did. Uh, when shooting this, and it was probably about an hour to two hours long. Okay. And the content that you just shared is so important. Um, and, and what that means to you and the impact that that played in you creating this work. Um, can you share a little bit more about that, why that's so important? Yes, um, it is so important to share about the missing and murdered indigenous women because the statistics of it with there's every four out of five indigenous women are experiencing violence whether it be sexual or uh, physical abuse and we're turning a blind eye to it um, i while doing this i wanted to make sure i represented those women correctly and so i pulled actually some statistics if you don't mind me reading them really please take quick. it away uh, so there has been 5712 cases reported of indigenous women being missing through the national crime information center but there has only been 116 cases that has been reported to the u.s department of justice which is outrageous of why are we not trying our best to find all of these women. Mm -hmm. um, and there's things like the Red River that I'm dressed in and clothed in that it's like a gash on my body. That had 134 women pulled out of that water. Mm -hmm. And all the Red River of the North stretches from Minnesota to Canada. It is about a 550 mile stretch and so far, 134 bodies have been found. And some people may question, oh my goodness, this is only out of the country. This is happening stateside as well. So for instance, in the state of Montana, Native Americans make up about 7% of their population, and 24% of Native Americans make up 
their missing people reports. That is a huge leap. There's, it's just crazy to think about that. And it almost brings up the question of why are we not doing more to help these women and help their families? Thank you so much, Mia, for sharing that information. That's just incredible to hear. And having had you share that, so Yvonne, then you're also dealing with that, uh, missing indigenous women with your work. And so can you share why you chose to respond the way that you did? Okay, sure. Well, um, missing murdered indigenous women actually hits very close to home for me. Um, I have a sister that has been missing since 2016. She's yet to be found. We have her in the system with the FBI under NamUs um, and various other um, websites that, that uh, we've been referred to. And to date, we still don't know if she's alive or not. And so it, it does, um, you know, this is a platform for us um, to get the word out because there's many families that are being affected by this right now. And so when I did this project, it was originally intended strictly for that. And then the storyline came out on the, um, the children, uh, the grave sites, the, the unmarked grave sites that were being found at the different boarding schools um, in Canada. And next thing I know, that is now being found in the United States, even as close to home as Haskell, I believe. And um, that also hits very close to home for me as my grandmother went to the Albuquerque Indian School boarding school. So imagine, had something happened to my grandmother, I would not be sitting here today because it's assimilation, it's genocide. And um, a lot of families to this day are affected by this or may not even exist because of this. And so it's a very important platform that we need to put out that, you know, be a voice for. Um, because a lot of people don't know. This is done, as I said in my title, it was done discreetly. And this is something that um, my piece represents with the little hands. And uh, when you see the little hands on, on the pottery, you'll notice some of them are starting to fade a little bit. And on the top of my piece, um, you'll see the four directions. I consider those the four directions. They look like steps on there. To me, that is their spirits being at rest, and they're finally using that step to get to the greater spirit world. The red cloth that is under that is what represents the, the missing murdered indigenous women, the blood flow of that, but also, as one of my peers up here mentioned, in their eyes was a blanket to wrap the children as the souls left the pot. So to me, this was the perfect moment to put this art piece together and um, express how I felt about it and while also getting the word out uh, on, you know, for the families who needed a voice. Thank you so much, Yvonne. That was really, really powerful. And it, it's just incredible to hear you all share this uh, with our audiences here. And so now I'm going to go to Molly and we're going to come back to what they've shared. So we're just getting started. Uh, so Molly, for you, um, with your work, the process of taking on an assumed identity where you decide what you are, you are who I say you are. Uh, can you share uh, just your, your thought processes as to why you decided to respond in that way. If Edward Curtis is going to say, this is what a native is, I can do whatever I want. I can be, I can be an Edward Curtis and be like, oh, this is a Norseman. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of heavy topics when you talk about issues affecting Native Americans. And I needed a pressure relief valve. Um, so I went for satire, like, let's make a message with humor. Um, he, Edward Curtis was known to go around with a suitcase full of props. Um, he famously edited out a photo. With, there was a clock in a photo with Native Americans, and that was too modern. That didn't represent what he wanted to show, because that was not Native enough. Um, 
he, was, he had a giant grant to go around and document the vanishing Indian, because he was an anthropologist, and he was like, oh no, they're going away. Let's take pictures of them. But he didn't just photograph them authentically. He designed what he thought they should look like. Um, and those photos still affect us today. I guarantee everyone in this room and everyone watching live stream has seen his photos. Even if you don't know the name, you've seen his photos. When you think of an old timey native, you think of his photos. And he has so much power over the image and perception of a still. So I had some fun with it. I got some kangaroo skins. I took my buddy and my son and I dressed them up. It's how I thought they should be. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Molly. Well. We've had an opportunity for you all to share how you created these artworks, but do you all consider yourselves artists? We're going to back up a little bit. Who here <laughs> actually considers themselves an artist? It's me. It is Molly. <laughs> just Molly. It's just me. <laughs> just Molly. So, well, and so Mia, uh, your background, so business and Pre-med, did I get that correct? That is correct. Okay. So the work that you did, a very public artwork, um, is that something that you want to continue? Uh, was that sort of, uh, that was a moment in time to create that artwork that's dealing with such an important and serious issue? Um, you know, is that inspiring you to do something more with that? Or are you like, all right, I've, I've, I've said what I said and I'm done. <laughs> Uh, for me, I am not like Molly, who is, considers themselves an artist. Um, I did do competitive dance when I was younger, but to me, that's a little bit different than what this is. So, with what's going on in the world with the MMIW, uh, and there's so much new information coming out, and now May 5th is a national like recognition day for this movement, which is amazing. So I hope to maybe do something, hopefully in the future, but I'm not quite sure. I don't wanna put it away in a corner and be like, I'm never doing anything like that again, mm -hmm. because I think it was amazing and very educational for those around me. Um, so I don't wanna say it completely no, but I don't wanna give it a for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is no problem. Uh, y Yvonne, for you now, had you worked with Clay before? And then there's a moment of surprise with your work that I definitely want to get to. But uh, your uh, business, business management. Uh, background, right? So for you, you know, creating artwork, what was that experience like for you? Well, first of all, I am not an artist. <laughs> I by no means. <laughs> um, so for me, um, part of what also inspired me to do this was, um, in my job as an executive director for the Gaming Commission, I also work with various federal law enforcement agencies, and one of those is the New Mexico Attorney General's Office. And they have a, um, in the process of looking for my sister, I came across the uh, Human Trafficking Task Force. So I've been doing some work with them and helping them with a couple of different things while well, still, you know, working with the other agencies. Um, and so for me, I, I think the inspiration will always be there for me to do that part of the work. As far as the pottery making is concerned, um, I would probably continue doing pottery, but more for traditional reasons mm -hmm. than not really to display, but just more because we use them um, where I come from. We still do utilize them for traditional reasons. So that would be about the only reason the, the most recent piece I did, did, did do was I helped my 11-year-old make a, a clay dog <laughs> for his project. <laughs> but that's, the, that's the most I got around to. But, um, you know, it, I mean, for me, I think when um, I did this piece, uh, so when she says, what surprise did you have? I had cooked the pot in an outdoor fire pit with some pinion um, shavings covering it. And upon my husband removing it uh, with a fireplace um, a wood handler, he, there was, it, it came out dark, dark. <laughs> and I wanted to cry. <laughs> because to me, the pot was meant to be, um, so mica clay, it, it should come out like a light brown with just a little hint of black. 
and I obviously put too much wood in, so it came out darker than I anticipated. But when he set it down on the table for me, and I went to go take a picture of it, in the pot was the ash that you see. That's what I took from above. And immediately, Mr. Um, well, Professor David Titterton's words came to mind. His words to me was, you always let your work talk to you. Your art will always speak to you. And sure enough, it did, because immediately, I, like I said, I noticed the ash first, and I thought, these are the ashes of the children. And then I noticed the hands. The hands, as I stated in my little statement, were originally orange. So to see that was, it was a very emotional moment for me. It was very moving. Um, and I felt in that moment that the children were speaking to me as a way of thank you for sharing our voice. So that was how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And so, Molly, you absolutely consider yourself an artist. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, just thinking about, uh, you know, your process and then what does that even mean to you to be an artist, you know, from uh, listening to Yvonne talking about creating pieces in the traditional sense, but then uh, how does that differ from artwork, you know, you are in an excellent exhibition right now that's showing that side, that voice. So for you, if Molly says, I'm an artist, what does that mean? I do art. <laughs> as easy, as simple as that. We think about it. Um, something I love about David's class specifically is how he, he really works on teaching us to think. And I think through his class, I got more comfortable calling myself an artist. You don't have to be like the best at the technique, you know, to be world renowned. You, just, you make things and express yourself through them. Um, half the time, I'm just going crazy, honestly. I was editing photos yesterday and I had a breakdown because I was like, I forgot what color is. What is color? <laughs> and then I remembered what color was. It was fine. I got like back in my flow. <laughs> but having the art speak to you is definitely, I don't know how to describe it, but that's a thing. Like while you're working with it, you're, you're kind of helping it come to life, which sounds weird, but it's like, mm -hmm. it, it communicates with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're making a quilt, you're like, where do you want to go? Oh, you want to go right here. Okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, and in that process of, you know, the, the artwork communicating with you, having that personal connection to it, uh, with what you've done with your work with the Norsemen. So is that part of a series? Is that going, so, so how many there are, do you have so far in the series? There are three, like, official ones. Okay. There's one I love where that guy who's sitting right there mm -hmm. looks so <laughs> intense. <laughs> oh, I, I love the intense Now you know one. you're going to have to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. That is right. <laughs> <laughs> I was making them, I was having so much fun. It's a digital image. It's nothing about this is authentic. And I had so much fun lying in it, just like not being truthful in the art. Um, I, I, I manipulated it a ton in Photoshop, which is try to make it look like a tin type and like present it as here's an authentic old photo of the vanishing Norseman, which it's not everything in it's a lie. It was so fun. <laughs> Now you're going to have to do some audio <laughs> recordings as well, some audio uh, to go along with uh, your series. And, you know, just thinking, as you all have heard from each other about your individual work, uh, but what are your thoughts on each other? I guess I'll, I'll, no, go ahead. Who, who wants to start? start. Right. Wants I can talk about Yvonne's piece okay, go all right ahead. day. Go right ahead. Um, go right ahead. Oh my gosh, I love your piece. I, it communicates so much. There's the children being whitewashed through assimilation. There's the, the red um, blanket of like the missing women holding the children who are also missing. And then I love, you had talked before about how your family did pottery, clay, and then that was gone. And then you went back to our school, which if you don't know, Haskell Indian Nations University started out as a, a forced, um, Indian boarding school. They would take the children, they would force them to go there for assimilation, cut their hair, Christianize them. We have a cemetery of children on our campus. Now it's a university <laughs> and it's a place, it was a place of cultural death and now it's a place of cultural survivance. So Yvonne goes there 
but disconnected from the, the clay and then comes and makes this beautiful piece that has so many like, significant aspects to it. And I think that is just so beautiful. It's the whole thing, all of it. <laughs> like, you're not an artist, but, like, <laughs> You made art. Yeah, you're yeah, an, yeah. That yeah. speaks. So, so, exactly. <laughs> yes. Whether you want to be one or not. You know. yes. Well, I was inspired by both my peers here. Mm -hmm. um, with Molly, it just, she's so correct in, in the way we are, um, I guess, pictured by a lot of uh, people that are not Native. Um, I am from Taos Pueblo, and we are a World Her Heritage Site. And it's a little disheartening when you have people that come to you because of these type of images that were set for them, is why are you not wearing a headdress? Why are you not in a buckskin? Or I thought you guys lived in teepees. <laughs> you know, we still seriously get that to this day. And, as you can see, I'm not very dark, so I get that question a lot too, is you're not as dark as I thought you would be. And you know, it just, it's a little disheartening. You just kind of see that, you know, there's not too much in the education system about native people. It's usually other things that are shared and, and, and you know, we are happy to share and, and have you learn about us if you just give us a moment to, like tonight. <laughs> So, and with Molly's, I mean, um, Mia's piece, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, of course, her piece hits home for me as well because I do see my sister in that. I'm hoping that's not her, and I'm hoping she's still out there somewhere, but it does. That, that is so real, and, and the young man that is walking by, that is so true. They won't look at you. They won't. And, and it, it, is, it is a silence. It is a quiet. So I'm really happy to see that um, now the federal government is starting to, um, with Ms. Um, Deb Holland in, in the Department of Interior in there, is bringing this to light. And um, I'm happy to say, like, just last week before we came, I was able to, I got a phone call asking me more questions about my sister. So it's good. It's starting to get out there. But it takes little steps like this, whether it's through art or sitting here speaking to all of you, um, for things to get out. So but they were both very inspirational to me. <laughs> for me, I can talk about both. Uh, Yvonne, Tonight, I was able to actually see it in person for the very first time, and how she was talking about the orange. When you really look close to it, you can still see some of the orange. You can still see, to me, when I interpret when I interpreted that tonight, it's like how she was saying it's uh, colorful. Like I was explained by uh, Pierre that when she glazed it, it could have been. When she did the orange, it could have been, and then it, sorry, <laughs> when it was the orange and then it faded to the white, it could have been how these children started, how they were in traditional, and then they had to be like whitewashed and things like that. So that's how it almost turned to. And, you know, we've talked about how the red underneath symbolizes for the MMIW, but as well, it can stand for like the blood of the children and all of the missing indigenous people. And in regards to Molly's, I, I loved it. It was hilarious. Um, we, we've talked before for hours and <laughs> we've joked about it. And, you know, I thought it was amazing how she talked about how she used kangaroo skin. You know, she could have use some other type to be more traditional and such things like that but it was to go out of pure irony and she went with kangaroo mm -hmm. i didn't mean to not talk on yours <laughs> i love your piece i love how he's not looking he's just walking by like that's not my problem and you're there like hello i'm dead and i'm missing and you have the feathers around and you're like you're missing in like your cracked earth i, I didn't mean to leave you out <laughs> I love, I love them both. No need to, to stop, just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Your, uh, you all sharing here is, is, is just uh, certainly a, a wonderful experience for me to hear you all share. And, you know, thinking about what you all are doing with these artworks and the power that they have, um, 
you know, I'm just thinking about when, with David, with his opening remarks about, you know, having those moments of, of happiness, uh, but then those moments uh, where you're, you're crying, but laughing, um, but dealing with, you know, um, that daily experience and that coming through uh, your creativity. And I know that during our conversations that we had, David, so I know you're out there somewhere, uh, but <laughs> David's involvement certainly came up mm -hmm. and what he was able to inspire or have you all feel inspired by in order to create uh, these artworks. And I would just love to hear, you know, you all share a little bit about David's role um, in the project. Okay, so I love David Tudor. <laughs> that man has a good heart. He makes Haskell better. We're all artists for him. because of him. You are. You are. Um, so I've been in a lot of art classes throughout my life. I just have. And um, David's teaching style is... I don't know how to caption that. Can someone caption that? But um, he expands your... Uh, the thinking. He expands the think. I write, man. Um, he showed us so many... Uh, artists and the statements they have made and he doesn't come to Haskell and be like hello I know more than you learn from me he comes to Haskell with like I am an art nerd and I have all this stuff to share with you and he listens to us and he learns from us too and he's humble and he has, he has a good heart um, but he's, he shows us the thinking and I think you see it in the, their work and the work downstairs communicating big issues and making them compact and deliverable. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, David. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, David, we do miss you and wish you were here. Um, it's kind of sad not having you up here with us. And um, I have to say that his teachings um, of art appreciation was just so contagious. It just, um, he just has this awesome passion uh, for art and he made you take a look at art from various angles. It was not just from one standpoint, but he, he made you think outside the box and he wanted you to address things at hand, what you were passionate about and basically everything that he taught you came from here. And that's what he wanted you to do when you created your art is it had to come from the heart. And I think that was the biggest takeaway that I had from him. So it was quite an honor um, to have him as, as one of my professors. And, and I thought being from New Mexico, I knew a lot about art. I had no clue. <laughs> I was behind. And this man was amazing. So thank you, David, for everything that you taught me. Well, for me, unlike Yvonne, who thought she knew all about art, I have no clue. Um, <laughs> until I met David, I had no clue at all. And thankfully to him, he opened up my eyes to uh, Native American and indigenous art. And from there, now I've just been like always looking and seeing new pieces. And it's been amazing. But for David, for me, not being familiar with the Native American art, when he gave me this like task to do to create this piece, I was like a deer in headlights. I had no clue what to do. So for him, he just told me, go with what you feel needs to be heard. Make a statement. Don't be scared to like ruffle any feathers. Don't just go for it. And so, you know, thank thankfully to him, he helped me create this piece and just helped me like gain the confidence of being comfortable to express this and not be quiet to be vocal about these issues. And so it's been amazing. Um, unfortunately, he cannot be here tonight. <laughs> but yeah, he's just been amazing. And so thank you, David. Well, thank you. And um, I want to keep the conversation going just a, a little bit longer uh, with the three of you. So are there um, Native American or indigenous artists that you all have now since become familiar with? Or Molly, I bet you already have a list. <laughs> Oh, there's um, so Cara Romero. Her, her art's fantastic. Is in the Nelson right now? I don't know. Anyway, she's a great photographer. I, 
You go. You talk now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Compared with the yeah. list. <laughs> so for me, it was Rebecca Belmore. Uh, she's the one that inspired me with the um, missing Indigenous women, mm -hmm. and um, Joe Federson because of the patterns that he used. He used uh, contemporary on um, patterns on basket work. So he was my inspiration. And the pottery that you mentioned, um, or, and, and that Molly mentioned, is um, my great aunt. This is my grandmother's oldest sister. Um, her name was Virginia Romero. And she was one of, uh, she was quite a famous potter. Um, and her artwork even ended up in Europe, in, in different museums and whatnot. And so, it kind of died along with her, so it was an honor to pick it up, the clay up again in her memory, and my Aunt Delfrida as well. For me, uh, like Molly said, Cara Romero was, she's an amazing artist, uh, but for my specific piece, I was inspired by Meryl McMaster, um, her collection of In Between Worlds, which is mine, is inspired by, and it was just really moving. It was not about the missing and murdered indigenous women. It was about a whole different uh, topic. And I wanted to do something along the lines of that where she like almost shook the world type thing with that topic and what she did in In Between Worlds. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that with this topic with MMIW. Well, thank you all so much for sharing uh, so much of your creativity and your experiences, uh, your knowledge with us. I am going to see if we've got any questions out there. Okay, and why did I even ask if we have any questions? <laughs> all right. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting my directions for our Q&A. So everyone that's here in the room, uh, we ask that you please go to the microphone and use the microphone so that our friends in the virtual can hear you and that's picked up in the recordings. All right, so here we go. All right, testing, testing, we're on. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Treyana or Trey Brown. I am an inter-spiritual agent of God's love, street minister, hello, homeless but not for long. I have questions, excellent moderation, wonderful, thank you. You are an artist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you are an artist. That is great. And I also see the interconnectedness of things. So I also have Native and Indigenous culture that's been stripped from me that I don't know. So I see myself in that. And I see black women in that. And I see women walking past people all the time. And as homeless, people walk past me all the time and don't want to help me. But that's fine. But God Almighty. Um, yours, the children, the, ch the children. Protect the children, love the children. Amazing. You are an artist as well. Everything is art in the entire world. So never say you're not an artist because you're always creating art. And you, oh. Okay, as an interspiritual agent of God's love, I think God is within everything. So that's within everything. Now, I've just started recently studying Norse mythology. Is there, uh, are, what are you doing there? Because you, you're Cherokee, so you're blending. You're interspiritual as well, are you? Am I picking that up? I am just a person. I, don't I know. think subconsciously you are. <laughs> person. You're awesome. I'm just a person too. Right? Did I have a question? Or did I just have compliments? I mean, sometimes there's no talk. We'll, we'll compliments. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. This was awesome. Okay, I guess I didn't have a question. I guess I broke the rules. So sorry. Oh, no, okay, you I'm didn't break sit the down. rules. Her turn. We'll take the compliments as well. I appreciate your energy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next question. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. This is such an eye-opening exhibit, and I think the world needs to know about it, even just USA. Is there any thought of gathering a few more pieces that you might have, maybe a few more artists from Haskell, and taking this on a national tour? Oh, well, we need David. <laughs> like, that's, like, that's a question for that's David. David question. If David is out there and listening, David, that question is definitely for you. I think we need to hear this. We need to see yeah. it and understand that... Native Americans just don't weave rugs, as <laughs> handsome as they are, but there's many more ways of expressing. And so thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. 
We, All right. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. We have Katie. a question from someone watching the live stream. And this one is for Mia, and then I have another question for all of the panelists. Mia, what do the feathers represent in your photograph? Uh -huh. So originally, um, I just wanted to spread feathers and uh, just to show like that we're everywhere, to have it also represent multiple other women other than just me laying there. There's feathers because people seem to connect feathers to be with Native Americans, they really connect it, but it just almost was like we're scattered, we're everywhere, there's pieces of us. Um, and so originally I had them laying around, but the wind blew them, so wherever the wind blew them, they blew them. <laughs> and that's art too. Yes. Yeah. You know. That is actually a lovely segue into this other question, which is what surprised you, all of you, about your pieces when you knew they were finished? That's a good question. I think for me, it, as I stated earlier, it would have been um, when I first took it out of the fire. Um, I, I felt like that was the moment for me that they, their little voices were speaking to me and and letting me know that I was their voice and um, in a way saying thank you for doing this for me and it just it was very moving to me so I, that would be my moment I would think okay so you know how art speaks to you while you're making it uh, because artists are a little crazy I think I just I felt satisfied and not like oh yes it works well done but more of like oh it's released me it's done <laughs> it is how it is meant to be now it is it's finished and it's satisfied with itself and I can I can go away <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for me with this piece that is in the exhibit I did not know how it was going to turn out. I thought it was going to be like one for the archive. Um, and I thought there was going to be some other ones that were going to be way better. And it wasn't. This one, when I saw the final product of it and seeing the gentleman walking past and the cracks and unevenness, it just kept adding like more foundation to the story. And so it was a big surprise to see that one. And I think also us having like big thoughts to communicate, that's not unique to us. All of David's students do this. Um, he's a fantastic teacher. Just, I want to say that. <laughs> I have some messages from David for all of you. <laughs> he says, thank you so much for your wonderful, kind, inspiring words. He misses everyone so much this evening. And to answer uh, the second question of the evening, David says, yes, we are looking forward to showing this exhibition elsewhere. That's great. <laughs> Can I have one more thing? Oh, I mean, the you floor is yours. Okay. Okay. I, I'm just here on the side. <laughs> so, <laughs> relating back to Joy Harjo, and just about, I don't want to stereotype us, right? But like, most native artists, we have themes that we're going to communicate in our art. You're going to get MMIW, which is how we say missing and murdered indigenous women, because we say it so frequently, we just say MMIW. You're going to get boarding schools and assimilation, and um, you're going to get misrepresentation and stereotypes, and oddly, we don't have environmental stuff up here, but that's the fourth one, and there's probably more, but these themes are in Joy Harjo's book. They're in everything. These are the things that we're screaming into the world at all times, and you're saying, we, you need to hear this. Yes, thank you for hearing it. <laughs> and it's not just us, it's all many of us. other students. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's a new Visual um, Nations book that just came out from this um, spring semester's Haskell students. So there's a whole nother batch of artwork out there that is sharing their same thing. And David is the one that actually put that book together. And I think all of us might have received that email just last week. And same thing, just different topics, you know, that he wanted to share. It's called Visual Nation Nations Magazine that, um, I, I don't know. Catalog. The, it's a catalog that he puts out. It's an online catalog. Yes. Said, how do we get it to them? Yes. If David could share that information with the public, that would be great so they can, you know, share the rest of our peers' um, artwork as well. That would be wonderful. You get so excited every time yeah, it so comes David, out. 
That, that question is directly for you, Dave. We want the answer before we wrap up this evening. <laughs> okay, yep, go right ahead. Fine. Question, um, what out, like, outlets do you guys, would, or how would you guys, rec like what outlets would you guys recommend us looking into if we want to look further into like misrepresentation, assimilation, and missing and murdered indig indigenous women, what outlets do you guys recommend us furthering our research and furthering understanding like what's going on? Well, I think for the boarding schools and um, missing indigenous women, um, I think right now the Department of Interior is doing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of information that, that um, Deb Holland is putting out there and, um, and there are other, um, we actually have a delegate, delegate get that is from Cherokee Nation, who yeah, is a do. senator, yeah, who is out there. And I'm sure she's more than willing to share as well. But I think if you just ask any Native American woman, they'd be happy to just share whatever, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's there. It hits us at home. And, and it's a scary thought to know that, you know, I have a daughter um, as well and, and daughter-in-laws to know that, you know, when they walk out that door to go to work or go to school, whatever, you know, the hope is that they come home. Same thing with your children, you know. It's, it's you want to make sure that they come home. And so, I mean, everybody needs a voice. I mean, it, it's just, um, I guess this is our little platform to share that voice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Adding on to that. Um, no, go right in ahead. <laughs> Molly, why are you trying to whisper? I know, right? <laughs> um, so TikTok, hashtag indigenous TikTok, um, Twitter, anything where people can just post stuff, there's people talking about all these issues at all times. Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, let's see, any more questions with, okay, yep, here we go. Oh, and gentlemen over here too. So here and then right here. I'll start with the lady. Okay, first of all, I want to say that your art that was exhibited out there hit my spirit. I think I came here about three or four times. Oh, and I, it took me, one time I think it took me over an hour because I was reading because I could relate to some of your experiences and especially when you put the red for the blood because that's a symbolization that we use. Mm -hmm. And for your daughter, my question is to you, why do you think her face is not plastered all over the television like everybody else that's missing. Mm -hmm. Because that's the thing that I notice, I'll say with you, and something that we have in common. When we have the missing women, there is no national headlines about it. But when someone else yes. is missing, you see that all day and all night long. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think we need to work on. So I just was like to hear yes. your take on it, and my prayers go out to you for your sister. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, what actually like pushed you guys to share all of this? Like, what inspired you to share this with everyone instead of just like writing it down and telling someone it? Good question. That's my son. <laughs> <laughs> you guys gotta talk first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, it, you know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So in this case, it's art that is worth a thousand words. You can write it all you want, but unless it is put in front of you visually, I think visual has the most biggest impact. And I think that was our way of, of um, expressing ourselves, is working with our hands and our thoughts and putting it into the piece that we all worked on. So. Well, for me, uh, I wanted to put this into a picture instead of words because for, I mean, you can put statistics and different names in, to an article, but nobody's gonna really read it. You know, there might not be people reading it. People will just skim past it, or they may think, oh, this is not relevant to me, so they'll skim past it and go to the next article. Whereas a picture, it will catch your eye. Um, 
It's just certainly like how it did when I was taking this, you know, it caught people's eye of me laying in the middle of the street. Was I probably in the way of them driving? Yes. But they, it made them stop and ask and look. So I thought that was important to really help broadcast the movement. So mine was, um, I was learning about Edward Curtis and I was like, why did he get the grant to do this? I mean, he did preserve like some languages and stuff and like that was cool, but why didn't they give the grant to indigenous people? Why didn't they give the cameras to the indigenous people? Why'd they have this white guy go around and be like, ah, oh, this is a native. And it's take that clock away. Now it's a native. You know, and I'm a, I'm a rascal. Am I a rascal? Anyway, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, Edward Curtis is doing this. I'm going to have some fun. <laughs> so I decided to be Edward Curtis and be silly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Let's see, any more questions in the room? Any more questions online? No, I think that we have answered all of them. So I'm gonna take this moment to thank everyone for attending this evening's event and let's have a round of applause for our artists. Absolutely. <laughs> going to say that uh, this has certainly been uh, very humbling for me uh, to be given this opportunity to hear your voices, see your work. Um, more educational moments like these are most certainly needed. And I think I'm going to let you all have the last word for the evening. So I'm, I've done my part. So you, I'm going to let you all close us out for this evening. Well, I guess I'll start. They keep looking at me. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you all for, for attending the, the uh, reception tonight and for joining us up here in the auditorium. And for those of you that are live, thank you um, online. Thank you for joining us. It was quite an honor. Um, to have this invitation from the Kansas City Central Library um, and uh, to be part of this thing with Joy Hargill's readings. And um, for David, for keeping us in mind and not forgetting us. <laughs> we feel love, David. Thank you. Um, it, it's just, um, it's been an inspirational, um, quite an experience for us. To, to be sitting here and to the process just to get here tonight was amazing um, with Krishan and Kate and Craig and David walking us through what we're going to go through, what we're going to do, what they want to hear from us and you know basically they just said express yourselves and it's, it was quite an honor to be able to sh sit here and share that with you and um, just want to say thank you and blessings to all. Yes. That was really good. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy uh, the what we did up here and all of our fellow students and colleagues that their work downstairs. Unfortunately, I can't speak on it on their behalf. I um, wish they were here so you guys can meet them and we can talk to them about it. But hopefully we will get that t chance some other time. And uh, yeah, it's just great to raise awareness and thank you to the library and Krishan and David. And it was an amazing experience. Thank you guys all for coming out. I mean, same. Um, thank you for Kansas City Public Library for having us. These issues are not distant. They are right here. These issues are not in the past. They are now. And they're not little statistics. These are gigantic statistics. Thank you for coming. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you, David. I wish you were here. <laughs> I don't know which camera, but we miss you, David. This would, this would be full of so much more joy with David here. You guys are yeah. missing out. He's great. Yeah. Well, thank you all. <laughs> you all are just wonderful. And thank you all in the audience. Those of you that have joined us in the virtual, uh, please come and see this incredible, incredible exhibition. Uh, you clearly have gotten a sense of the power that is behind uh, the creativity. 
uh, and uh, just the beauty that comes out of and the impact that comes out of that exhibition. So those of you that are out in the virtual, if you've not seen it yet, please come. Katie, can you actually remind us of the exhibition uh, dates? I believe the four more days four to more see days. the exhibit. So now, I need you to come here now, basically. So thank you all so much. Good night, everyone.